everybody. I'm back. <laughs> oh my God, you're back. Vacation is over. The retreat is over. I'm back. <laughs> and I know <laughs> I'm still on my porch though. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming and checking out our Spark Healing conversation for today. Uh, I'm Tajmika Torak, the Executive Director of the Firecracker Foundation. And I'm here today with my friend Sonia Shah from the Ahimsa Collective. So, um, hi, Sonia. Hey, Tajmika. I'm so sad that you're off vacation. I'm also off vacation. So, I'm sad for you and I'm sad for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't. It's going to be a slow return. I'm having a hard time re-engaging. Uh, I, vacation felt a little too good. So <laughs> so we're going to be talking about um, learning pods today and child care collectives. Um, as many of you know, there is a child care crisis happening um, due to the, I mean, really due to systemic white supre supremacy, but also a global pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just, just a little global pandemic on yeah. top of systemic white supremacy. Um, and so um, both Sonia and I are parents. Um, and I know that many people that I work with are parents and lots of people in the world are parents that are friends of mine that are really terrified, um, nervous, exhausted, unsure, all of the, all of the things. Oh, and, okay. <laughs> and when the schools were closed, I immediately started looking for resources and I came across childcare collectives. And most specifically, I came across the, um, Oh gosh, I'm going to forget the name of it, but it's the Inter Intergalactic Conspiracy of Child Care Collectives. Thank you, Google. Mm -hmm. um, and resources that they had published online through a collective that they, or a meeting they put together at the Allied Media Center. And my friend Sonia has actually been a part of Child Care Collective. So I was like, help me. And she did. <laughs> so what is your experience with these sorts of learning pods? Um, what are they? What are, what are they? What is a child care collective? What is a learning pod? Yeah, my God. Um, well, you know, I, I just, I guess. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I, Sonia. I asked you a question. I didn't even oh. allow you to introduce yourself. Would you like to say anything about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> um, not really. I'm with the Ahimsa Collective, and Ahimsa is a Sanskrit word that means do no harm for anyone who cares. Um, um, I just, I just wanted to say something before we like jumped into what it was. It's just like, you know, and I think it relates to what it is. Is that this time is so intense, and it just sort of like resiliency and creativity. I think it's really birthed out of the resiliency and creativity of parents and the just deep love and care for children or young adults. Um, and that this is like the heart to me of any childcare collective or learning pod is like, nobody else is doing it. And, and that is just what happens. And out of the crisis is birthed like incredible ideas about how to be, you know, how to support our children. And so, my own like little launching in this whole world has actually come more from, I teach, um, I also teach as a faculty in a very cutting edge university with like really radical pedagogy and like really amazing ways of thinking about learning and cohorts and groups of people and how we learn and how we think and how we have agency and how we support each other as adults. Um, and by extension, like, and being an educator have the minute something happens, which turns into a crisis of education or just care. I'm like, Oh, right. I know what to do. So I think that I guess, you know, this word learning pod is like emerged on the scene in this COVID era of um, no schools opening or some schools opening and not knowing what to do. And I feel like Honestly, it's a really informal system of trying to figure out how kids can be together and learn together. Um, and how do we create these pods of, of, of young people, of students, of our kids who can be together and learn together. And I think 
the piece of the child care collective that, you know, with Tashmika wrote this beautiful document um, uh, is like the extension of also a set of values that goes along with that, a framework that goes along with that, a sense of equity and justice and inclusion that goes along with that. And just like, how do we see this on the, in the much broader frame of like, um, nobody getting left behind. And I love my friend Sujatha said this the other day, we were talking about, also to, uh, also touch me because friend Sujatha. <laughs> uh, we were actually talking about this in my backyard in a distanced way, but we were talking about um, how we're, we have a learning pod that's getting st started, a few actually. And what does it mean for other young people, our kids age who don't have the resources to figure out, you know, kind of how to do this. Or, um, and um, just like two things came out of it as Sujatha said, you know, there's this idea of all of us or none, but why don't we just say all of us, all of us, not the none, mm -hmm. none just all of us, right? Just how do we just frame what we're doing in terms of all of us? And it made me think about like, what I would really wanna do is get my hands on the list of every single kid's parents that are in my son's seventh grade class, which is I don't know, about 150 people and be like, okay, y'all, we're having a meeting. Like <laughs> we show up, like even if like one third show up and let's talk about it and you organize your kids' friends and I'll organize my kids' friends and we will figure this out and we will rotate houses and we will do groups of four or five and we will make it happen. So to me, that's like what a learning pod or childcare collective really like that sort of stemmed from that. So that's what I would say. What about you? What would you say? You know, I, as you were talking, I was thinking um, that I have been thinking about my neighborhood. So with Lansing, um, we don't have, and I'm not assuming that you do, but I feel like our schools are split up. And so I was trying to imagine what would happen in my neighborhood because with COVID, we have to stay distant. We can't necessarily, um, you know, like ha have a bunch of um, kids driving in a car to go to a place together. There's not carpooling has changed and we don't really have great systems of uh, city like transportation anyway, public transportation. So I was like, what would it look like um, I, I do feel lucky that I have a lot of really good friends in this neighborhood, both parenting and non-parenting. And so for me, I've been asking friends in the neighborhood, like, what does your schedule look like? What are, you know, like, how are we going to um, work? Are you planning on working in the evening? Are you going to do on-site work? Are you going to be at home? Like, can your kids come over on Tuesdays from four to eight? And Mike, because I can do evening work. And then, you know what I mean? Like, what, how are we going to do all of these little things uh, or these kind of schedule sharing too? Um, and so I was thinking so close, you know, like, who do I already have a relationship with? Whose kids already trust me? You know, that um, ranging in ages, because I have the the three of different ages. And then I've also been asking my kids to check in with their own friends. You know, e even at the beginning of when COVID hit, I was like, how do you know that your friend is eating? Like, do you know that they have housing? Do you know, and trying to frame it in a kid-friendly way. Like, I can say it like that to you, but like, so how, you know, like, have you heard anything like if they're um, about their family, you know, where they're living, um, you, like really, and of course I have the different ages. So my high schooler can hear that differently. Um, but what, and what my high schooler said is that some kids who were struggling before are still struggling now. Like the struggle hasn't really changed for them. Um, it's just that people are more aware that kids are struggling. <laughs> so, you know, so for me, that that's one piece of it is like looking super hyper local in my own little neighborhood with the kids that I already know. But then I'm also looking at it from the, the space of being someone who's in charge of an organization. Mm -hmm. So how am I working a collective with my staff? How do my how are my staff members able to work and also know that their children are going to be protected? And since we have already built um, a collective and, you know, like we already have a relationship, it becomes really easy to say to Carolyn, my office manager, our operations manager, like, yo, I love your kids. I would spend like they were some of my favorite little people. So I'm happy to spend four hours a week hanging out with them while you do whatever and we can just swap. Um, and we've also talked about hiring um, collectively as individuals, not the organization, but like, what if we had a pool and we hired uh, a tutor to come in a couple days a week 
to hang out with the kids and do the schoolwork with them that they're actually having to do through the school district for those of us who aren't um, using a different model of like homeschooling or unschooling. So those are kind of the, the two ways that I've thought about, like, how are we doing these, how are we taking care of these little babies that we love? Because I think you're right too. It does come down to love and, and a lot of trust, you know, who do yeah. I trust with my babies and who would trust me with their babies? Absolutely. I agree with you. I mean, I think it's really same thing when this started. Um, I just quickly reached out to the kids that my my kids were close to and their parents and said, hey, here we are. You know, let's can we think about how to support ourselves and each other during this time? And what we started with in the first four months, three months was doing twice a week, a couple hours um, the kids would get on Zoom, and as parents, we took turns teaching the kids something, anything. Like we asked them what they were interested. In. It was everything from like the Big Bang to creative writing prompts to tea, cooking and art. And one of the parents is an artist, so he really went for it and taught them incredible. Like this is how you shade, and this is how you do that. Another one was a chef, so she taught them. She was literally like go get the ingredients from the store and then we're going to have the zoom camera in the kitchen. They made omelets and they made macaroons and they made whatever. That's so um, awesome. Yeah. And it just was like, we're just getting through this, you know, and um, trying to create and continue to have some sense of community. And after the summer, you know, I feel like this, this whole land of COVID and also just sort of where we're at, because it's not just COVID is like, it's a continued, like, I feel like it started as like every week, like how to every week was it felt like a big change, like how mm -hmm. to alive and then it's like every month, and now I'm like, oh my god, it's like every semester, you know, <laughs> and um and the level of like intensity. That we have oh, you're breaking up a little bit. That's weird. Can you hear me? Yeah. There's like a. You know, it's not in my neighborhood, which is so weird. Is that better? Yeah, it's better. Okay, that's weird. Um, but like, how do we stay in it for the long term? And so what I, reaching out to the parents again was the sense of, hey, well, look, we know we're going fully online. We're also not hiring tutors to take over unschooling, deschooling, whatever. I don't, I can't, un, I can't, I have three jobs. Like, I run an organization. <laughs> like, I also can't you know, right? Like, and I also want them to have like a sense of social, I think the social piece is really big for me. So, they're going to be online at Berkeley High School, at you know Berkeley Middle School, whatever. And can we set something up like two days a week? They're with these four kids, and they're just going to they're going to be online together in different rooms. They're going to take breaks. I had we had a call last night, and it was I didn't even think about this. One of them was like, "Well, if four of them are online at the same time, we have to figure out our like bandwidth shit stuff, right? Like, just like can everyone be online at the same time, like?" You know, yeah. <laughs> we got to figure out the internet situation. We have to rewire the whole house or whatever it is. But <laughs> like, just what? And then, is, does that really make sense? You know, would it make more sense to do like two or three afternoons instead? You know, so that mm -hmm. they can the day in the morning at home, and then you know, go afternoon so that they can be together. So, so what's happening for us is we have three different groups now. We have um, my, my son's little group, my daughter's little group, and then there's one that's a different group that's sort of a group that's known each other since they were like three. And we're trying out doing hopefully two days a week with one and two days a week with the other and one day a week at home um, with us. And, and I don't know, we'll see how it goes. And constantly checking in like with the kids and you know, saying like, is this working for you? Is it not working for you? Like, well, yeah, because it's not going to work for them if they don't like it, you know? Right. So, you know, and I, you know, I've, I've, I've heard a little bit of like, you know, there, it's like, it became, it was sort of a, something nobody was, we were just talking about as casually as parents. And now, and then I saw a New York times article about it, right? Like, <laughs> about learning bugs. and it's like, it's just really like, it's birthed out of freaking necessity. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I don't care what the school board says or the teachers union says or anybody says, like, you know, in the end of the day, we're doing what, what's necessary. And, and I feel like my conversations with parents have been very responsible about what's the comfort level? Like, what mm -hmm. do you need to happen? 
And of course, the person that feels like the least com comfortable in the sense of like we have requirements, then we build around the requirements, right? Like we we'll try mm -hmm. to get outside as much as possible, like no driving in cars together, whatever it is. Yeah. But I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of not appreciating um, a sense of control that comes, you know, from people who run schools and things. Like, well, you shouldn't be doing this. It's like, you, well, you should get your act together then. And then we wouldn't have to do this. Well, and it's all, uh, yeah, I, I definitely feel the same way. And I, I feel like this is a moment where we don't have a choice, no. right? Like we do not, parents do not have a choice to make, they don't have a choice not to make a choice for their kids at this moment. Like there's no, we can't just up and decide that I'm gonna quit my job because I also have to feed these children. Uh, we can't up and decide that we're not gonna educate our kids because we want our kids to be educated. We can't decide, we, we also can't force um, schools to open and we don't want to. So like, I feel, I, I agree with you. And I also like my hackles go up when there's criticism of parents trying to find a way to keep their kids safe find a way to uh, like be able to work so that they can bring money into their, they, so they can have an income um, and without anybody offering support. So I'm like, don't criticize me as a parent dealing with a global pandemic. If you're not offering, like I, I, I actually tweeted the other day that my mirror was dirty and no one was allowed to complain unless they were gonna Venmo me money for childcare and housekeeping. And that's how I feel. Like if you have if you have something to say about the way that I am dealing with a global pandemic as it relates to my children and my home, you are more than welcome to send me some money. <laughs> Otherwise, don't don't because this is so hard. And it's and it's you know, it is it is creativity, but we know that, um, you know, like it's it's like hard to be grateful at the same time. Like I'm glad that I have the capacity to have, like I'm glad that I have really rich relationships with people that I can trust with my kids. I'm grateful that I have um, a flexible work schedule so that I can help navigate some of these things. But I also know that not everybody has that. And so for people to criticize the the strain and stress under which like these parents are making decisions is so inappropriate um and i agree with you you know i got asked the question during an interview you know if do learning pods increase kind of the systemic like the the barriers and disparities and i was like if it does it's not because of us <laughs> like, like we're doing the best we can with the situation at hand uh the system was set up for us to fail so what do you want me to do? Not help my kid have a good educational experience and they try to include their friends? Um, because why? I don't, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. So, um, and I think of course the reporters are asking because other people are asking. I'm not shade, like I'm not throwing shade at the, at the person who is asking. Mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about, um, let's talk about, you know, it sounds like you, We've talked already a little bit about how we already had established relationships with the kids, um, you know, the kids in your son's school. And then, you know, I'm talking about friends in the neighborhood and my, my work colleagues, but how do people build, start having those conversations with one another um, and start moving into the direction of, of setting up their, their collective or their learning pod? Yeah, man, that's a hard one. You know, I mean, I, I feel like I'm only here to ask the difficult questions. This is very high, bro. No, but I feel like I mean, you know, what's so like interestingly fascinating about this time is the crisis of community that's being like really made visible, and the crisis mm -hmm. of like, um, like what, what, like what do we value, and do we really have relationships with each other, right? Mm -hmm. And um, how do we forge those? And I feel like we go to school in like learning algebra and we go to school in like reading the great novels or whatever the, whoever, whichever novels those are. But we don't go to school or, or pay so much attention to like, how do you really cultivate and create collectivity and community, right? And like, you know, and not even school. It's just that there's a whole paradigm framework and shift that feels like it is at the foundation of being in a, a real sort of childcare collective or like a learning pod or whatever. It's like, I'm not just doing this about me. I'm doing this about everyone else, you know, and I care mm -hmm. 
cares as much about, you know, these kids as I do my own child. So the all boats rise has to apply if I, mm -hmm. you know, if, if I want to see the, all the other kids succeed and I want my kids to succeed and then everyone succeeds and everyone's happier. And yeah. you know, I have these images of being, being like when my kids were younger, um, it, like really deep images of like going to like a park and seeing parents with their kids and their kids are on a swing and this intensity of like my kid is swinging and that is the most important thing and <laughs> you, like you don't get the swing because my kid really wants to swing so we're gonna swing as long as we want until my kid doesn't feel like swinging anymore. <laughs> you know to get on the swing and like it's individualism the culture of individualism and capitalism and the values we teach come out on this on, on the playground and, mm -hmm. you know, come out in parenting come out all the time and like mm -hmm. i want my kid to get theirs and that's it and that's what it's about and that's it and i'm like all about my kid getting theirs and if you're on the team it's only to serve my kid being on the soccer team it's not to serve mm -hmm. the team. like we have a like a lot of work to do you know like as humans you know to yeah. shift like the way we look at like, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a human? What does it mean to be a And the, like, the, the, like, that we've lost some, like, ancestral memory of how to be in community that we have to ask ourselves the question, how do I reach out to somebody? You know, why? Yeah. You know, you just reach out because you care. Like, hey, yeah. I'm vulnerable. And I can imagine, like, when we're not used to it, when we've been inundated with individuals, it is vulnerable and hard and almost shameful to, mm -hmm. to ask for help. Hey, yeah, hey, I don't know what to do. I actually need you. I need us. Oh my mm -hmm. God, I need us. Like, and yeah. I don't know how to do. I don't know how to do us. So yeah. like, we have to now be in this weird muddled way of trying to figure out how to do us and I you know I'm not like my kids friends are not all my friends you know <laughs> we're not all on the same page we all have the same values like and I'm willing to figure out how to do us you know in yeah. because all of them love their kids and they love my kid and yeah. so we're we're gonna we're gonna sort this out you know and we're gonna stay in it with each other to sort it out so I was just laughing I think there's this fallacy that community is this like woo woo like everybody loves each other like sometimes community is like compromise it's like no well, we don't exactly see the same but like we're in this little we live two blocks away from each other you know so we have to look well, yeah no i appreciate that and i i think it is really interesting to think about how we have sent our kids to school with people we don't agree with already so, yeah. so like, there's also this fallacy that somehow creating a uh, community or creating these collectives is, is going to be like this idealistic where we can actually match our political views and our, you know, and it's, you know, like that's not necessarily going to be the thing that happens, um, nor should it be, especially if we're using the framework that uh, or, or the language of Sujatha, right? Like, what about just all of us? Like we all need our kids to be safe. And, and really as an organization and as people who work on child sexual abuse, in this moment we can recognize, no, we really, really do yeah. need kids to have access to safe and trustworthy adults that are not in their family system. That's actually critical for this moment. Yeah. And so even, so there's the reach out to ask for help, which is very vulnerable, but also keep in mind that when you are reaching out, and offering help, you are actually doing prevention work. Like when you yeah. are offering to keep a child safe in your home and to create a learning environment for them, even if it's not in your home, I understand that there are limitations around this, but even, you know, I think about my kids a lot and the many times that my kids have, um, you know, I've seen their, their comments to other friends about things and they have been really supportive. Sometimes, sometimes I, we have to have a conversation, but <laughs> they're not perfect. No, yeah. but please do not think my children are perfect. Yeah. <laughs> please don't do that to me. But they, or them, 
But I've seen them do things where they have shown up for a friend in a really healthy way. So it's not just about us as parents ha having connection, but also, like you said, that social piece is important. We want our kids to have social lives and be social humans. But in terms of prevention and in terms of creating safety for kids, they need access to their peers because they're going to go to their peers before they're going to come to us anyway. Yeah. Um, and so I think that there's there's also that like we're not going to create a school environment or setting that's the ideal during a global pandemic. No, no. <laughs> like we're, we're not. We're not. So, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I know you keep seeing me look to the side. It's because I have a very aggressive best friend squirrel that um, is, is being me right now. And um, I keep hanging out with him. And what's so cool doing is like these old almonds. They're not new, everybody. Don't at me. I'm not feeding a squirrel almonds because I have a lot of money. They're old. Oh, it's, so funny. <laughs> it's sitting right here eating an almond in my face. And it's very cute. I haven't named it yet. So if anybody has names for my best friend squirrel that I haven't named. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think added to like what we're talking about is, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you felt, but I know that after I had kids, I really, really noticed how like the West wasn't set up for like, we're not a culture that really cares about kids. We're not. No. I mean, like, let's not pretend that we do because we offer childcare in a stank ass room at a conference. We have childcare. Like we have, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> you know, kids aren't really welcome in, you know, adult spaces at all. Like they really are. And, and even, you know, my, my work colleagues, um, some of them have older, and there's only one other sort of work colleague who has a child. Nobody else has children. And, and it's a definitely adult dominated atmosphere, but we've always made it like really, really like an open space for whatever, like the same way, like how do we really incorporate the needs of what we need as parents and what the kids need. Um, but like, you know, to see this whole educational thing also as like parents' problems and teachers' problems. I mean, it's a part of the problem, right? It's not just like the fact is that we don't really value like teachers and kids and parents, like we don't, you know, we don't create these these environments for them to be in. Mm -hmm. It's like let's just get them away so that we don't have to deal, so that they don't get in our face, you know. So or we're trying to do our work. So we can do our work, right? Yeah. So what does that look like? What does that look like to actually say this is sort of our problem? You know what I mean? This is our work. This is our work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We, it, I think COVID for me was also like, we have always been a space that I would have considered friendly for kids. I mean, I bring my kids to the office. Several of my staff members have kids at the office at various times. Um, and our office is pretty kid friendly because we work with kids, right? So like there's, we try to keep them out of the therapy spaces, but we have toys, we have coloring books, we have all these things, but, um, but we had never considered, um, that it, it wasn't like a thing that we thought of intentionally. It was just a thing that we allowed, which is two different things, yeah, like, totally. you know, and me being nice to my staff's kids. I mean, which is like a normal human being thing to do. It's not like an actual perk of the job, but because the, the bar is so low, <laughs> like literally just allowing kids in your workspace is actually seen as like some revolutionary act. Yeah. So when we were talking about this child care crisis as a team, we were also thinking about, I know for me, I was feeling very like, why didn't we think about this before? First of all, um, which is a lot of the things that are coming up right now. It's like, we never thought about this before. Um, and then also why weren't we providing this to our clients and like our volunteers and our board and just making our space, a space where children are a part of the work when we spend so much time talking about prevention and safe space for kids. Yeah. So even for um, a space that is about kids, you know, like all we do is really for, for kids. We didn't think about it that way intentionally. Yeah. And so I think that, I think another important conversation is, uh, and I included a little brief thing in the collective about what it means to be the boss of something. Mm -hmm. And how are you changing the structure or culture of your institution or organization during this time when you know that 
there are parenting people on your staff and there are non-parenting people who are likely going to be taking on more caretaking. So are we having intentional conversations about what that looks like and, or are we going to punish people um, for not showing up as if they aren't living with other humans that they're responsible for? Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just, and, and I think something you said earlier, and I think we always have to remember is that we're not responsible for ending all of like capitalism and white supremacy, right? Like, it's just like mm -hmm. all of these things are symptoms of the way, like the normative sort of the socialized normative has set it up so that we exist in, in this culture of individualism and capitalism and like everything is separated and, you know, we're just always struggling and trying to make it different. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and we're always struggling against the, a very, very deep social norm that is that exists a certain way that also becomes embedded in our psyches, right? It's like beautiful, just what you said about the difference between a kid being allowed, you know, mm -hmm. and a kid really being sort of embraced, you know, or whatever, you know, what does that space look like? I don't even know, like in this, and, and if I think about my social cultural work surrounding it also doesn't allow it you know it just doesn't i'm like how am i supposed to get everything done which is even a certain mentality right it's a very, like like sort of, you know work driven mentality in a certain way like if all of these kids are around you know versus <laughs> like if i was in a flow with other people you know what it what would it mean if like we just had multiple roles and responsibilities where I was like, oh yeah, your kid needs a little help right now. Oh, I can go do that. Or like the dog needs to get walked. Oh, I'm, I'm up for that. Like, you know, like it doesn't matter if it's my dog or your dog or my kid or your kid. Like, what does it mean? If, like, what would it look like if they were centered in uh, as much as our, our sort of productivity and work was centered? And we have to center our work and productivity because we have um, responsibilities that we've committed to others in a certain way. So it's a big systemic. And what is that driven by a, a model of sort of success and like getting bigger and, mm -hmm. and white supremacy. So it's like, we can't undo it. It's like this constant attempt to undo big systemic issues from just an interpersonal, you know, or meso sort of like community-based lens, which is like, we're setting ourselves up for just incredible frustration, right? So, um, and at the same time, what else do we know? I don't know any other way to be, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm just like, I'm just gonna keep at it. You know what I mean? I'm gonna well, keep showing up. I I, yeah, I was listening to a podcast with Miriam Kaba and someone asked her, like, what does it look like after the police are defunded? And she was like, I don't know. It's not my job to know. I'm not the oracle. She didn't say this part. This is me saying what <laughs> she said the first part. But like I, what I got from that is her being like, I'm not the oracle of every community that's going to tell you what community safety looks like for your people in your community. Yeah. I just know that this is the way that we get to safety and harm like that we get rid of a lot of the harm that's been happening. Um, and so when I think about this moment, you know, what it looks like at the Firecracker Foundation is different than what it's going to look like at a PR firm or whatever, you know, yeah. like it, it, that is going to be different. And so I also was just thinking as you were talking too, it's like, um, this just clicked for me that me and our organization allowing kids into the space did offer us the relationship building that has gotten us to this moment though. Yeah. You know, like I was just remembering as you were talking, there was a moment when um, Carolyn's baby uh, was real little, like months old and um, he was real fussy. And I picked him up and I was, uh, I was trying to put him down for a nap <laughs> in this bouncy chair. And I like was sitting there, you know, you know, anybody who's ever tried to put a baby down for a nap, it's like you bounce real fast for a while and then you slowly, <laughs> you're not bouncing anymore and then I'm like crawling out I'm wearing a pencil skirt and and like tights and I'm like crawling out of the room yeah. and then slowly shutting the door on my knees and I told Carolyn I was like it has been many many years since I put a baby to sleep but yeah. that brought back a whole lot of really good memories <laughs> like that whole process but like if we hadn't been a space where children were allowed 
first as like, maybe that's the first step is just because then you do have to get into a rhythm of what that looks like and tending to the community in that way, the way that you described where it doesn't matter whose dog it is. It doesn't matter whose baby it is. Um, you know, it, when we're tending to the community, it is an act of, of relationship building. Um, and it's also an act of self-care. You know, I think I, we loved when we, when we have babies in the office, we are like, I mean, we love having dogs in the office. Like there's something about tending to other people that is not our actual work work, sending the emails, having the difficult conversations, doing all these things that are work work um, feels far better when we can actually hold a baby for 15 minutes and while Carolyn does a thing or walk somebody's dog around the building um, and take a breath and take a breather or color with somebody's kid, like it actually improves the, the work environment sometimes. I mean, and sometimes our kids are just sassy and we're like, actually, we would like you to leave. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think also, I think there's like these two places we're speaking from, right? As people who run organizations, you know, the, the place of like radical welcoming and hospitality, you know, mm -hmm. that like permeates all of our cells, right? Of the sense of anybody's welcome, your dog, your baby, whatever, all welcome. Mm -hmm. Also the mentality of like, it's so, like, like what we talk about with the Ahimsa Collective is like, nobody's policing you like, and your work. Like, like mm -hmm. the other hours that we say we're working, these are our sets of responsibilities. And it's really about you to manage your life in a way that, and if you need to pick your kid up, you know, at three on Thursdays, that's fine. You know, like you pick your kid up. If I, if I, I work my work schedule and I've led by example is like, I get up at five 30 and I have like five 30 to seven 30, you know, without my kids, my kids get up at seven 30. It was like seven 30 to nine, nine 30, 10, or like seven to nine was getting them out the door. Then I worked from nine to two to three, and then I was home. And mm -hmm. like, that's my schedule. There were some folks in our office who, um, and like, again, no judgment. They wake up later, they come in later, they roll in at 11 and they're out at six. And then they work another hour at night. And that's their, that's how their lifestyle is set up. Mm -hmm. and I think like this not policing and judging like this sort of nine to five kind of thing, but saying like, like, what does it mean that we all agree to a set of responsibilities and that within that, there's a lot of freedom and agency to then figure out, like, how can I make this work with my life? And it does, I will say it does fall apart when people take advantage of it. And that has happened. Um, yeah. and that's hard. Um, but when 80% of folks are actually doing it and there is a spirit of that, it does actually really serve and benefit. And I think there's another piece of anyone who is running an organization that can just start to create that culture that it mm -hmm. makes it and, and lead by example or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then there's this thing about parents and like, like just this question of like, where do I even begin? How do I get started? Right. And I think like, I would honestly say it really starts with yourself. Like first, like just doing the hard work of like on myself, like, what do I need? What do I need for my kids? What do I need for myself? And how am I going to get over my barriers to asking others to join this um what do i think is going to come up and then like taking some steps to even just reach out to one person who has a kid or not you know that you're in relationship with um one person like holy can you do this with me um can we, can we do this you know, and, and it from there and let's see what kind of seed starts from that and mm -hmm. you know and then like hey can we see can we bring in one other person and what's the right and and including the kids including that and like what how do you want to do this what do you want to learn about like what how much days of the week feel too much for you what are you stressed out about like, on, on the day? you know sort of sort it out like you know really slowly and gradually like one parent at a time if it's brand new right if this idea of like oh shit now i have to organize everything is like brand new i think like start with yourself go to one relationship and then let it let it sort of come from the relationship you know what does it mean when we let things really come from the relationships versus like have all the ideas of the whole thing figured out you know and yeah um yeah i think that's that's really gorgeous and you know i i have um 
an offering and then a question. Um, also, don't forget our elders. Like yes. I didn't really think of, I was thinking about people who were in the parenting, but there's also a friend of mine who's a grandparent that reached out to me and was like, I wanna, let's figure something out. And I honestly hadn't thought about elders. Like how are we, because we're also very protective of elders right now as we should be. Um, but there are also grandparents who are supporting you know, youngers with their family that are looking for support in that too. So um, I wanted to say that. And then a question, especially as someone who is an educator and thinks a lot about educating um, people and how, you know, what are you feeling or how, what would you say about people who are very stressed out about kids falling behind um, this year? Because I, when I'm listening to parents, one of the things that seems to be coming up a lot for them is like, there's a lot of stress around my kid is not going to be able to go into the next school year prepared or what have you. Mm -hmm. That's such a great question and thought. Like, I think the, I know that the way that I approach it is, um, well, here's my, here's my own personal lineage of education. I went to 13 years of public schooling, um, some not so good in, in Manhattan and the Bronx, some decent. Um, and then I went to Brown and Ivy League for four years. And then I went to some other random, you know, master's program. Um, and like, and I say that because they were really, really different kinds of educations. And I think and then I didn't, my career has nothing to do at all. <laughs> Not a single thing, an iota of anything I went to school in at, even my master's. I got a master's in film and video. I do not do anything <laughs> in film and video. So what is, I did not know that. Yeah. I'm sorry that I'm laughing oh, so yeah, big. Yeah. I really yeah, did not yeah. know that. I mean, I've had so many people be like, how'd you, you know, whatever. It took me uh -huh. a long time in my 30s, especially to feel like not like a, you know, like you feel like the degree means that you're qualified when we mm -hmm. know really true and experience makes you way more qual qualified oftentimes mm -hmm. um degrees help to understand things but you know experience really qualifies you for for the work that you're doing and you know i have really not lived a straight line in my own professional life it's been a, like follow your bliss kind of passion and i think like what is the message of like what's the point right what is education for what are we trying to set kids up for what are we trying to set adults up for and i feel like the, the point that's driving us should be what does your kid love to do what do they want to learn like wh how can we create a lifelong relationship to learning that is exciting and critical and engaging and not like, how do I get an A, right? And are they going to pass it home? And I also get that that's really, really real. You know, so the next step. But I do think I teach at a college that is, um, you know, like I said, very radical pedagogy in the sense of like, we're with adults and we're really thinking about it's an interdisciplinary degree. It's really driven by what students want to learn. You know, it's a broad humanities and social science degree, and there's so much freedom to create. And um, I think like there's just something about like what's the North Star of, of like uh, your child, um, which maybe helps to drive like what their educational path is. And they're each really um, individual. Like my daughter is does really well in formal schooling because she's very linear. She's incredibly studious. She reads on her own, you know, in her like a book a day and she should be in an international back an IB program and like she just is a nerd like a hardcore <laughs> like like athlete and nerd and that's good for her you know mm -hmm. that's her and so I might be thinking about oh how do I get you into like a, an IB program so you can do you know she's an academic that's what she's into like mm -hmm. the primer He's like a great creative thinker. He wants to be a park ranger, you know? So I'm not thinking about like, I'm thinking about outdoor schools. I'm thinking about like really nonlinear creative um, education for him, you know? And their, their paths are gonna look really different. And I think like, how do we think more about where, what, like, what are our kids inclined towards? And, and with mine being in seventh and ninth grade, now I can see where they're inclined, right? It's part mm -hmm. of it. But, you know, and have some rigor in terms of like, 
it matters that you show up to school and it matters to, that you, you like, it's more teaching accountability and responsibility to show up to your mm-hmm. class. It's like the values mm-hmm. of teaching are about accountability. They're not about, and like self-responsibility, right? I don't really care about like getting ahead. I care that they show up because we committed to it, you know, and what mm-hmm. is it? commitment right and I don't know so I think about it a lot in terms of like switching the lens of like how do I really see what 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 is success for my child you know based on what they love what they love or what they're inclined to or what I'm introducing to them and they're gravitating towards um as opposed to like how do I make sure they don't fall behind because we're all losing a year or two Mm-hmm. In reality, like it's not going to look the same for anybody. You know what? In ad- what our kids' admissions to college looks like? How many mm-hmm. co are there going to be? I don't know. Like you know, how many like weird like I don't know what grade they got because they were online for two years. Like I don't know. Like mm-hmm. we don't know what? So so we have. It feels like just we have to question, um, like even like worrying about what the success model has to be for college, right? Like it's, are there a certain set of kids that are gonna get ahead because their private schools are gonna open and they're gonna have private tutors? Absolutely. But how is that any different than what's happening right now anyway? to get into college, like that's still gonna happen. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know, that's what I would say. What would you say? I, you know, I'm much of the same vein. Um, I, um, I dabbled in college. That's what I tell people because I get the same question, like, how did you end up in this work? And um, it definitely was a situation where I followed a vision that I had. And this is where we are. And this is, and every, every year, the place where we are looks a little bit different as we follow the path, you know. Um, And I, but I've always enjoyed uh, reading. Um, my There's a joke within my community that Tajmika's probably got a book for that. Like if you if you, if you have a thing that you're curious about, then Tajmika is, has read the book or has a list of 17 books that you need to read about this thing because it's really important, you know? Mm-hmm. And so there's this, um, I actually want to mention, there's a book that I just read um, called The Teenage Liberation Handbook. Um, and it is about um, it's about the process of um, unschooling or doing self-directed learning. Um, but there are lots of books out there about those things. I, the reason why I am posting that or why I'm sharing that book as a resource is because there are portions of it um, that talk about this idea of being behind. And I think, like you had said earlier, it actually starts with us as parents reflecting on what we think is actually going to happen if our child does not come out of this year at whatever level we imagine um, or the the school district says they have to be at and walk that path, you know, and walk that path forward. Like, okay, so what if my child loses this year, which, I, you know, I'm, I'm on the fence. I think that kids, I have a lot of faith in kids. I think they are so smart and resilient. Um, I think that if we have uh, an education system that graduates uh, 19% of children that are not able to read, those kids are smart as hell if they can get through school and get a diploma without knowing how to read. Okay, and I'm sorry that that's the example that's coming up for me, but, you know, because I don't want to celebrate that. I feel like kids need, you know, they need to learn how to read. But I think that if you take a step back and think about the resilience of our children and the um, creativity and imagination and, um, you know, just grit that it takes to be able to make it through a school system right now, I feel I would, I'm going to be surprised, actually, I think if um, kids do not, you know, like, I feel like they're just going to be fine, you know, (laughs) in terms of like their education. And the reason Reason one of the reason, or one of the ways that we can make sure that they're fine is by letting go of this idea that during a global pandemic, our children have to somehow be more superhuman than we are. Like, yeah. I'm not necessarily going to cope very well this year either. <laughs> Why do I expect? It also reminds me of like um, sex education and and the idea of abstinence when many many adults did not practice abstinence before they got married. And so I'm like, why do our children have to be this different version of humanity 
than yeah. what we are. Absolutely. That's not fair. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. So, All the things. Yeah. I mean, I, I think like, I would just say, you know, there's something about like parents, like just give, like give yourself a freaking break, cut yourself. Like we need to cut ourselves some slack, you know, and like, like remind ourselves every day that we do the best we can do, you know, and we can't be everything for our kids. We can't solve all their problems and we take it one step at a time. And I also feel like we don't even know the lessons that like young people are learning. It's going to be such an interesting generation. Like, like what in this developmental period, like what are the things that they're going to come out with that like people are going to study, you know, like what, how much humility is being taught right now? What, like, why don't we value humility? Like, I, like gratitude for what we have, like how much are they probably like, man, I wish I could go back to school. Right. Like, like that's why I can see my friends. And like, what's the possible grace and gratitude they're gonna have in saying, I get to see my friends or I get to go back to mm -hmm. and there's this I remember seeing this like study of a bell curve of like happiness and choice, you know, and the sense of like it was a bell curve, right? When there's when there's like not enough choice, like people who are really struggling, right? We're talking about equity issues, right? The happiness level is lower when there's a peak place of like the amount of choices and our happiness. And then like why the wealthy are so sad and depressed or there are too many choices and then mm -hmm. it's down, right? And so in this place of the of privilege of being able to do everything, going anywhere, whatever, if that's you, you know, and those things get taken away, you know, what does it mean that maybe like a little bit of discipline, a little lack of choices, like teach us a little bit about like, oh, I'm really grateful for what I have. I'm grateful for what I can do. I'm like, you know, I get to see a couple friends, like that's amazing, you know? And like we, you know, not living in, in excess, but living in our means a little bit more. You know what I mean? I just think if we take, if we can, if we can really absorb like the whole like sort of cosmos around us of mm -hmm. what are we being asked to do? How are we being asked to be different? You know, yeah. like maybe, maybe we can chill a little bit and say, okay, it's okay. <laughs> chill. Like, that's the like, name of this, this entire segment is going to be, maybe chill. we can chill a little bit. <laughs> maybe we can For real. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And go and, yeah. and, and, and yeah, and like not have this crazy expectation of ourselves in a freaking pandemic, you know? It's like we we can't just go on as business as usual. We're not supposed to. We're not supposed to. No, and I I also think you know it reminds me of you know when we were um, you know you offered so much feedback to the child care collective toolkit, and I just want to name again that that toolkit came out of work from other people <laughs> that. I pulled together under the framework of child sexual abuse and domestic violence in this moment for the global pandemic. Um, so there are these collectives all over the country. Some of them are not active anymore. Some of them are, um, but they put a body of work online for us to share. Um, and the, again, it's like the intergalactic, again, I said it at the beginning, I always forget. It's the ICCC and it's in, it is in the Child Care Collective if you wanna go and find out more about them. Um, but I think one of the things that became clear when, when at the be very beginning stages um, that's important for parents is like, what are your goals right now? So for some of us who have, um, depending on the age, depending on the needs of your children, your, your goal might just be that they are safe while you are working. Like that might be the goal. And you don't really care if they uh, do um, do great at school because at this moment you are like your boat has several holes in it and you have several fingers in each hole. And that might just be the goal. And so I think that's another thing that's really important to name when you're talking to people about sharing any type of child care, any type of support network is like, what, what are our goals here? Because if I, for me, if your goal is that your kid um, gets all A's, I might not be the person to hold their child, like to hold their, their study time. Um, I, you know, of course I can monitor and help them with that. But my goal is always going to be that, you know, um, that they are safe and encouraged and loved during this moment. And so if they can also get all A's, then maybe we can work together, but I'm not gonna be the one to reinforce that. Yeah. And so I think that this is also a moment where we can get clear about, 
you know, get, letting ourselves off the hook, but also really being clear about what our goals are in this moment. Yeah. Um, because if our goals are uh, things that are arbitrary or outside of our control um, that are going to stress out our kids and our relationships, we might want to rethink yeah. what our goals are yeah. during a global pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. I love that really starting with your goals and sharing your goals, you know, and, and taking it from there. That makes so much sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're almost at an hour. We did a good job. We I'm did. just going to say. <laughs> we did. Yeah. We did the best we could do. We did the best we could do during a global pandemic. Yeah, we sure did. <laughs> So I just want to remind people again, you can download the toolkit for free. Um, there are, you know, lots of resources about different ways to um, to educate your children, whether you're choosing to do a homeschool or hybrid. I mean, many of us are homeschooling even with, with school support, right, because we will still be in our homes. Um, so there's lots of resources available for, for those kinds of things, but I would also encourage everyone um, to just listen to your kids, you know, listen to your kids, your family, your needs, your loved ones, and build what you need for this moment. And really don't, don't worry about what other people say you think you need. Um, worry about, it's like that video of that little kid that her dad is trying to buckle her seatbelt for her. And she keeps saying, worry about yourself. <laughs> Just chill a little bit and worry about yourself and let us know how we can support you. Um, and if, if there's things in that toolkit that you have questions about, we want to be a resource because our goal as an organization is to make sure that children have access to safe and healthy relationships during a time where their access to teachers and coaches and all of those people who usually are safe people outside of home um, are not able to be in the same, uh, able to have the same level of contact. Um, and that's why we created it or pulled that together for you. So any final words, Sonia? Yeah, I know. I would just add like just uh, this piece about like feeling your heart and not letting anyone else you, you know, tell you what is right or wrong you know and you can find it and every way is the right way if you have to send your kids to school and there is a school because you have to work if you have to plug them into something for hours it's just okay like like and like really allowing ourselves the space to be you know to really know that we also there are others out here and we see you you know, and we see each other, like, and that we, you know, we're kind of in this together and, and not to feel so isolated in that place. So, yeah, we see you and we know you're doing the best you can. Yeah. Because we're also doing the best we can. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> same, same. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sonia. Thank you. I really appreciate you being here um, with me and just appreciate you as a friend anyway. But thank you for coming and having this conversation with me. For, to make this conversation visible for other parents. Yeah. yeah. Take care. Bye. <laughs>